Well, thank you. And Tom, thanks for a great uh, tour down, as they say, memory lane with details <laughs> that I think, you know, are very relevant here because the world has changed a great deal. And uh, I think no one here disputes the criticality of uh, export controls, the importance that we place on being very, very clear that there are certain technologies that must be very much uh, held close and others that can be shared and then others that, you know, certainly should be a part of the world market. And trying to get that right is not an easy uh, thing to achieve. At times, this discussion, I think, has felt very static. And Tom's emphasis on change is, I think, very appropriate today because all of a sudden things really are not static on this front. Uh, we've seen some remarkable change within the last couple of years that I think should give heart to all of those in this room that really are trying to make a system that, as I think the earlier panel discussed, is more transparent, effective, uh, clear in terms of where we're going with this. The last administration, uh, in the waning days, but nevertheless in the waning days, uh, took some steps that were very important in terms of the process by which we issue licenses. And as we looked at that and the presidential uh, directive that went behind that, it was very encouraging to see that State Department was able to respond and has dramatically cut the licensing time, which matters a great deal in all of this because there were times in which I think everyone felt they were caught in an endless loop. So those kinds of changes were setting a uh, good tone, if you will, for then the new administration to come in and with, I thought, great uh, vigor and great attention early on, and that's one of the things that's exciting about this, is this did not wait until the latter half of the first term for someone to pay attention. Uh, within the very early days of this administration, it was clear that President Obama and his advisors decided to make export control reform a real priority for this administration uh, for all of the reasons that I think are the right ones. Uh, that we do want to have the ability to work shoulder to shoulder with our allies uh, in critical aspects of the battlefront. And at the same time, we do want to be effective in terms of our ability to export our technologies, including ones that, frankly, we'll not be able to afford unless we're able to look at these as joint enterprises with allies in the future. So all of that, I think, has come into play here as we are at this point now looking to say, all right, what can this reform include? And, you know, yes, it can seem a major mountain to climb in some ways, but I'd like to call attention to what we really think are short and medium-term reforms that can be done outside of the purview of new legislative reform. Not outside of Congress, by the way, I want to point out, because Congress plays a very critical role in this, and their support and oversight is, uh, I think, going to be a part of all reform discussions. But new legislation, no. Much of this is something that is within the power of this administration uh, to take on. So let me mention a few of those to you, uh, because I think that some of these, while they are straightforward on the one hand, are nevertheless uh, ones that it's going to take a tremendous effort to accomplish. Let's talk for a moment about rationalization of what is on the USML. Uh, the munitions list right now uh, contains both specifics and vagaries that get in the way of each other. And that's something that I think could very well be addressed. Uh, there are sections of the code that really say you know, there are some definitional things here that can be applied. Uh, section 120.3 and 120.4 have a number of criteria that are very useful to us at this point. But at the same time, elsewhere, we're confronted, of course, with language that talks about uh, anything that has been designed or modified for all of a sudden becomes a part of the USML, no longer considered a commercial item, and... <laughs> that catches a tremendous amount, especially when you consider, of course, that the smallest of widgets that's in that definition in a larger box it catches the box. So this is an area that really can be approached, and I think some very important changes made. Um, and at this point, I would also say that, you know, we saw good changes last year 
on the commercial list on Section 17C in terms of what does constitute commercial uh, use, commercial civil aviation parts. That's the sort of thing that we'd like to see again more application when it comes to the munitions list. Now, caseload management. Uh, the mention of the Joint Strike Fighter is a great example of where if we could approach things from the standpoint of looking at these as programs and looking at the trusted partners that are on the other side and approaching these not on a one-by-one -one transaction tra by transaction basis but from a broader programmatic standpoint we could make some massive changes. Now in mentioning that there is an exception to what I said that so much of this can be done uh, within the administration and within the authority of either current rules or new rulemaking uh, because the US-UK and the US-Australia treaties I think everyone in this room should keep on red alert that these need to be passed. There are very few people who take exception to the fact that our ability to work on a really a caseload management basis, a program licensing basis, which is what is underneath these treaties, uh, makes 100 percent sense when you're talking about the UK, when you're talking about Australia, when you realize that 99.9 .9 percent of the licenses for that are for transfer to the UK are ultimately approved. Uh, this goes not only to the enabling of a trusted partner, but it also goes to efficiency in applying our resources to those issues and technologies that really do need the resources and attention. So I would point that out as another area, a second, that's important. A third thing I might say is clarification of the existing rules. You know, when I look at AIA's members and I look at the defense industry broadly, a lot of what we need to pay attention to here is not necessarily for the largest of the defense contractors. They do have legions of experts and lawyers and people who really can uh, step into this and parse what are very difficult at times distinctions and rules. But the suppliers, the small guys, uh, that's where you really see a need to present clarifications and transparencies because for them otherwise the risk is simply too great. Uh, the risk of not knowing where the technologies stand and then not knowing what might happen if they inadvertently made a mistake. So I, I would really appeal on that front as we're thinking about where to apply our energies and effort because that too could make a tremendous difference for those who are the least able to parse uh, at least able to take the risk. I think a fourth thing that I would mention is something that really is within the purview largely of DOD uh, and we hope that from the very top, from the standpoint of Secretary of Defense, Secretary Gates, Bill Lynn, um, Ash Carter and others, there will be real attention paid to the issue of the process that DOD is using for technology release because right now we have got multiple reviews, multiple boards that are all considering this. And by the way, not on a parallel basis and on a rationalized basis, but on one that is sequential and that doesn't necessarily coordinate one with the other. And all this before the State Department can take action. So it's a level of difficulty, a level of lengthening the process that I think we really do need to see DOD address. And I have to believe that given the conviction that Secretary Gates and Bill Lynn and others have brought to the fact we need reform, reform in this area could make a tremendous difference. And I think the final thing I would mention is that in all of this and considering the way we got to where we are, that we not forget the next generation of technology. Because remember that some of the things that are going to pose some of the greatest difficulties are ones where there's already a lot of unknown. Uh, unmanned aerial systems, just as an example. Uh, we really do need to think about how this system is going to address those and not just the current generation of fighter technology. So with those things in mind, I would say there's a lot of work for us all to be doing. I don't think there's going to be any doubt that this administration is serious about taking it on. Uh, and we certainly, from an industry standpoint, could not be more committed or enthusiastic about this effort. It's truly important.